Welcome to Single Malt History with Gareth Russell, pouring out your serving of pure, distilled, intoxicating, and occasionally delicious history. And as the smart ship grew, in stature, grace, and hue, in shadowy, silent distance, grew the iceberg too. Thomas Hardy, 1912. The winter of 1911 had been a relatively mild one in the Arctic, meaning that more large chunks of ice than usual broke off, acquiring lethal mobility with their freedom. Carried from the Arctic down to the Atlantic on the Labrador Current, these icebergs grouped together in fields dotting the Atlantic, where they menaced ships crossing the ocean, even as late as April in 1912. There were far more icebergs than usual, hazarding the ships carrying the 50 thousand people who, in an average week, travelled between Europe and North America in 1912. 2,208 of whom were currently on board the British luxury liner Titanic, halfway through her first trip to New York. Although they couldn't see the icebergs that lay ahead of them, the Titanic's passengers could certainly feel their calling card, a noticeable drop in temperature by Saturday morning. This whisper of things ahead caused some passengers to abandon their walk along the deck to instead stay indoors, finding spots by the electric fires or radiators dotting the Titanic's lounges, libraries and cafes. However, some of the passengers thought dodging the brisk sea breeze was a bit feeble, a bit pathetic. Instead, they hunted out thicker coats, hats and gloves and kept walking. One such family was American railway tycoon John Thayer and his charismatic wife Marion, one of the leaders of Philadelphian high society. Keeping up their daily exercise may have been medical advice after John's recent treatment for depression at a private clinic in Switzerland. Either way, the Thayers took regular strolls on the Titanic's promenade and boat decks, typically joined by their 17-year-old son Jack, who was returning home to America to start his college applications. His first choice was Princeton. Jack Thayer's recollections of the family's weekend strolls on the Titanic are read for us by Paul Storrs. The weather was fair and clear, the ship palatial, the food delicious. Almost everyone was counting the days till we would see the Statue of Liberty. I occupied a stateroom adjoining that of my father and mother on the port side of sea deck. And needless to say, being 17 years old, I was all over the ship. When walking around the decks with my mother and father, we had short chats with many of the other promenaders, among whom I particularly remember J. Bruce Ismay, chairman of the board of the White Star Line, Thomas Andrews, one of the ship's designers, and Charles M. Hayes, who was president of the Grand Trunk Railway of Canada with all of whom we spent quite a lot of time. We went to our staterooms around 6.30 to dress for dinner. After dressing for dinner, the Thayers descended to the first-class dining saloon, where they shared a table with the Titanic's 62-year-old captain, Edward Smith. Based on what the Thayers remembered later, Captain Smith clearly told them that the Titanic was actually increasing its speed despite the decreasing temperatures outside. Her radio operators, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, 
were also receiving wireless messages from other ships in the area warning Captain Smith of an enormous ice field directly in the Titanic's path. In deference to these warnings, Captain Smith did admittedly slightly alter the Titanic's route going further south for a little longer than he had initially intended, but he did not reduce the speed. In fact, he did the opposite. In the last 24 hours, the Titanic had travelled 519 miles by the same time on Sunday, she would have travelled 546. This apparently lunatic decision by Captain Smith later birthed one of the most enduring legends of the Titanic. We've all heard it, that her owners were trying to break the record for the fastest crossing of the North Atlantic Ocean. Well, this is not only untrue, but also technologically impossible. There was an award for that record called the Blue Ribbon, R-I-B-A-N-D, and in 1912 it was held by the Mauritania, the prize jewel of White Star's main rivals, the Cunard Line. The Mauritania had broken the record two years earlier, with a crossing time of about four and a half days, the Mauritania's speed and engines were so impressive that she held that record incredibly for 19 unbroken years until the summer of 1929. Before that, however, the Blue Ribbon had bounced between different ships and their owners like a hacky sack. The truth is, though, that not all shipping companies regarded the Blue Ribbon a surprise worth having. Yes, your publicists would be delighted to include the phrase world's fastest steamer on your advertising posters. But there were serious downsides to holding the speed record. The first being that it ran the risk of decreasing your passenger's comfort while travelling. A German luxury liner, the Deutschland, had actually seen her career ruined by winning the speed record. To keep the title, she had to regularly run at her highest possible speed, which severely rattled the inside of the ship, interrupting passengers' sleep and meals until first-class customers dropped away altogether, followed by the others, profits imploded, and eventually Deutschland had to be retired, renamed, refitted with slower engines and deployed as one of the world's first cruise ships. The fuel costs incurred by trying to keep these trophy-winning speed queens at peak velocity were eye-watering, which is why the Titanic's operators, the White Star Line, had last held the Blue Ribbon in the summer of 1891 with their ship Teutonic. After that, White Star decided it just wasn't worth competing. Every White Star ship since the Teutonic did not have record-breaking speed incorporated into her design. With their advertising, the White Star Line had then cleverly leaned into not being the fastest on the ocean. Why shake for five days when you can sleep well for six? Was one day less on your journey really worth the added vibrations and pitching of travelling on a speedy ship? It was size that the White Star Line focused on. Size, splendour and safety, not speed. For their Queens of the Ocean, the Olympic in 1911 and the Titanic in 1912, they stuck with the same policy, deliberately installing machinery that would never be able to compete with the Mauritania's when it came to speed. And this tactic was working, because the White Star Line was a hugely profitable company by 1912. They neither wanted nor needed the Blue Ribbon record. Some passengers enjoying their food in the Titanic's second-class dining saloon unintentionally corroborated White Star's business strategy. 
when they told fellow diners that they had recently travelled on board the Lusitania, a previous blue ribboned record holder, and that the slower Titanic was far more comfortable and stable to travel on. However, as I argue in The Ship of Dreams, simply because the Titanic didn't want to break the record that spring, and in fact could never have been the fastest on the ocean, that didn't mean she was going slowly. This was a maiden voyage. Captain Smith wanted to check his new ship's operating capacity. He wanted to see what the engines could do. So with each new day of the voyage, more boilers were lit to see what the Titanic's maximum speed would be. Smith was planning to work the fires up to test a full speed run at some point on Monday the 15th. Some of Captain Smith's defenders later pointed out that before the Titanic sank, the standard practice when approaching ice at sea was to keep up speed so that ships could get clear of the ice fields as quickly as possible. Captains trusted in their lookouts to give them enough time to turn the ship away from any big icebergs looming up ahead, and they generally believed that the safest policy for a ship was to move her as quickly as possible through ice zones. It was only fog that caused the big liners to slow down to a crawl. I should qualify this by saying that not every captain agreed with this policy, and there were British as well as American admirals or commanders who stated publicly after the Titanic sinking that Captain Smith should have slowed down, given the sheer number of ice warnings arriving into the Titanic's radio room from nearby ships. It's also perhaps worth pointing out here, in the interests of historical veracity and fairness, that despite how hideously he's shown doing so in many movies about the Titanic, the White Star Line's managing director, Bruce Ismay, never put pressure on Captain Smith to keep up the Titanic's speed. Smith made that decision entirely on his own. Generally, though, there were several standard nautical practices in 1912 which seem bizarre to us today, one of which was highlighted through some good news on the Titanic at lunch on Saturday the 13th, when Captain Smith and the ship's designer, Thomas Andrews, were told that a small fire in Boiler Room 5 had been safely extinguished. This fire had been burning since the Titanic left Belfast nearly two weeks earlier. This sounds horrendous to us utter lunacy, but apparently, with so much coal jammed into the bunkers, these kinds of low-risk fires happened on ships all the time before the First World War. They weren't considered at all a reason to delay a voyage because they were typically confined to the coal bunkers. What usually happened and did happen with the Titanic's fire was that crew members would work to empty the bunker, thereby removing the source of the fire, hoses would be used if necessary, and they would then inspect any damage once the problem was extinguished. On Saturday, an inspection of the Titanic's former fire site, Boiler Room 5, was conducted, and it seemed the worst damage had been scorching off some paint and the bottom of one of the compartments was dinged. However, you might have heard of this fire because a couple of years ago, it was described as a mystery that had just been discovered by historians who had a new theory about why the Titanic really sank. So the theory goes that the single bunker fire had so weakened the Titanic internally that when she later hit the iceberg, it caused the ship's side to buckle and blow outwards, exploding, thus leaving the ship fatally exposed to the ocean. Well, firstly, it isn't a new theory uh, that was a bit disingenuous. We'll call it clickbait. 
A quarter of a century ago, this theory was aired in a British documentary, uh, first broadcast, I believe, on Channel 4, and in 2004, it was disproved by a research paper published by Ohio State University working with the Geological Society of America. In 2017, when people were trying to pass it off as a new idea, they disingenuously, or perhaps um, innocently but incorrectly, showed footage of the Titanic's wreck two and a half miles beneath the ocean, highlighting for their viewers precisely where the Titanic's hull had allegedly exploded outwards upon collision, thereby opening her boiler rooms to the sea. But this whole boiler room fire theory is a decent lesson to always be careful with what we're shown or believe from a screen because it's really easy to massage these things and present them as proof. For instance, the underwater footage they showed in the 2017 documentaries wasn't anywhere near Boiler Room 5. It was actually the exterior of the Titanic's meal room where they sorted the letters written by passengers and crew. It buckled out due to the impact caused when the Titanic ploughed into the seafloor after she sank, not when she hit the iceberg. Then, newsreel film showing the Titanic preparing to leave Belfast was played because it also allegedly showed that a point in her hull was discoloured, which was cited in the documentary as proof of how dangerous the bunker fire had been. Again, though, that's not what it showed. The discoloration was caused by deterioration in the century-old film reel, and once more, the highlighted area was the meal room, not the boiler room. So call me crazy, but unless the Titanic's meal clerks had all collectively gone insane at the same time and decided to torch every letter on the Titanic before holding their epistolary inferno up against the hull for ten consecutive days, it's pretty hard to see how any of the film footage corroborates the theory that a fire played any role whatsoever in the eventual sinking. The bunker fire was a nuisance, that's all, not a serious risk to the Titanic then or later. Even most of the Titanic's crew had no interest in or knowledge of the fact that Boiler Room 5 had happily ceased to be a subterranean irritation by Saturday afternoon. They carried on their duties, just as the passengers carried on with their day. Saturday the 13th was more or less the halfway point of the voyage, so by then most people had settled into a comfortable routine. If you were travelling in third class, maybe you were being entertained by the musical talents of Eugene Daly, a passionate Irish nationalist en route to compete in the Gaelic Fesh in New York. If politics weren't your thing though, maybe it was best to avoid. Likewise with religion in second class, where more and more people were trying to avoid earnest conversations with the young Baptist pastor, Sidney Clarence Stuart Collett, desperate to make converts. One of those who was now avoiding the deck due to the cold outside was former US congressman, the elderly Isidore Strauss, who was using the time to read in the first class lounge. His book of choice was titled The Truth About Chickamauga, an epic and heavy history of a battle fought in Tennessee during the American Civil War and written by fellow passenger Colonel Gracie, who had loaned him a copy. Colonel Gracie was one of several authors on board the Titanic. Another first-class passenger was Jacques Futrelle, whose bestsellers included murder mysteries and early examples of the science fiction genre. But One sci-fi book, which certainly wasn't stocked in any of the Titanic's lending libraries, was the novel Futility, first published 14 years earlier in America and written by a man called Morgan Robertson. In the years since, 
Futility has become notorious, but it really hadn't sold very well when it was first released. It's highly doubtful that anyone on board the Titanic had ever read it. Certainly, I don't think anyone in the White Star Line offices had read it. After 1912, Futility became regarded as a bone-chilling book that some people claimed showed the universe had been pre-echoing about the Titanic disaster long before it even happened. Futility is a story set on a fictional British luxury liner called the Titan, which one night is going too fast into an ice field where it hits an iceberg and sinks with the loss of thousands of lives because it isn't carrying enough lifeboats. An extract from Futility is read for us by actor Peter Evangelista, and listening to it, it does really sound like the similarities between the fictional Titan of 1898 and the actual Titanic of 1912 went far beyond their names. She was the largest craft afloat and the greatest of the works of men. In her construction and maintenance were involved every science, profession, and trade known to civilization. On her bridge were officers who, besides being the pick of the Royal Navy, had passed rigid examinations in all studies that pertain to the winds, tides, currents, and geography of the sea. They were not only sailors, but scientists. The same professional standard applied to the personnel of the engine room, and the steward's department was equal to that of a first-class hotel. From her lofty bridge ran hidden telegraph lines to all parts of the ship where work was done. From the bridge, the engine room, and a dozen places on her deck, the 92 doors of 19 watertight compartments could be closed in half a minute by turning a lever. These same doors would also close automatically in the presence of water. With nine compartments flooded, the ship would still float. And as no known accident of the sea could possibly fill this many, the steamship Titan was considered practically unsinkable. In short, she was a floating city, containing within her steel walls all that tends to minimize the dangers and discomforts of the Atlantic voyage, all that makes life enjoyable. The Edwardian era was one obsessed with spiritualism and the belief that science and spirituality could now work together with machines measuring whispers from other planes of existence, in the way they could now carry voices in things called telephones from one corner of a country to another. If technology could bring sound invisibly from one part of the world to the next, why could it not try to capture voices from one world to another? And so... After the Titanic sank, Futility was republished, and this time it went on to sell like proverbial printed hotcakes, with people shuddering at how similar this 14-year-old story had been to the tragedy of 1912. But here I must pour a dose of cold water on the Futility legend, because it does now seem as if its editors might have altered a few details when they reprinted it in 1912 to make the novel's storyline even closer to what actually happened on the Titanic. That being said, Robertson's story is still similar enough to cause a slight intake of breath. It's still a pretty chilling prediction or coincidence, if not quite as shudderingly so as we were first led to believe. When Morgan Robertson wrote his book, the year 1898 does still lead us to the Titanic as a warning, if not quite as a prediction. 
The Titanic was a potent symbol of two apparently contradictory forces that gripped people at the time, and I would argue we are also dealing with today through things like the internet, artificial intelligence, and social media. On the one hand, we are aware of the benefits of technology as it rapidly changes our lives and makes leaps forward that we once thought were unimaginable. But at the very same time as this amazement, there are just as many people who feel uneasy. There's a stirring, lurking worry that technology is hurtling forward at such a rate that it will soon cause far more problems for mankind than it does benefits. We worry our laws haven't caught up with our technology, and neither has our common sense. The Edwardian period grappled with this too, confidence alongside fear, excitement sitting next to uneasiness. The Edwardians, of course, were to be proved devastatingly right in their worries, when, to the general astonishment of many, technologies hitherto unfathomable would fire into the seas, trenches and air of the First World War, decimating and brutalising a generation. For some people, and Morgan Robertson seems to have been one of them, the massive strides in ocean liner design had been increasingly worrying rather than encouraging. A year before Robertson published his story of a seagoing titan that sinks because of hubris and over-trust on technology, a German passenger liner, the Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, had broken the records as the largest and fastest passenger ship in the world. Her success set off a fevered spell of competition between the major shipping lines and the governments encouraging them. The Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosso was so commercially successful that her owners commissioned three running mates, all patriotically named after German royalty, each one a stellar commercial success. Rival German companies retaliated with different ships of their own, occasionally naming them after US presidents to win over American clientele, while British and French companies began hitting back with liners of their own, always larger or faster than the ones before them, always with some new feature. The leaps in ship size became so remarkable, so unfathomable, that safety laws were hopelessly behind them. For instance, British legislation on lifeboat capacity capped their requirement at ships of, quote, 10,000 tonnes or more. The Titanic was 46,000 tonnes. She and the Olympic were half again as heavy as their nearest rivals, the Lusitania and Mauritania, which were themselves nearly twice as heavy as some of their German rivals, like Kronprinzess and Cecily or the Kronprinz Wilhelm. All of these technological leaps had made the great passenger ships far more comfortable, and in most cases, a lot safer. It's a bit wearying, I think, this idea that the Titanic was punished for her splendour. There's no point pretending that the Titanic sank because she was large and luxurious. The idea that one is punished for comfort is absurd. But the tragedy of the sinking was, in part, in a very real and large way, wrought because of an overweening confidence in technology. Only a few years earlier, a smaller White Star Line ship, the Republic, had been accidentally rammed by another ship, and she had taken nine hours to sink. There had been more than enough time to safely evacuate those on board. The Titanic's captain, Captain Smith, had previously said, Speed makes for safety under practically all conditions except that of fog. The belief that they didn't need to slow down because the greatest risk they faced was the inconvenience 
of hitting an iceberg, which would damage and delay them, but which was fundamentally unlikely to sink them. Explain some of the logic behind increasing speed amid decreasing temperatures. And to me, it seems that nobody was more dangerously deluded by the chimera that technology had made ships borderline invincible than the Titanic's cheerful, gentle, charming captain. Three years before, he had told a journalist that dramatic shipwrecks were a thing of the past. They belonged to history because, quote, modern shipbuilding has gone beyond all that. After dinner with the Thayers on Saturday evening, the captain joined his first-class passengers in the reception room next door for the usual concert. There, one passenger heard the captain joke that the Titanic was so safe that she could be sliced into three separate parts and she would still stay afloat. Within 48 hours, half of Captain Smith's joke would come true. The second half, tragically, would not. Peter and Paul are suitably apostolic names, and so I devoutly thank Peter Evangelista and Paul Storrs for their time and talent in reading the words of Morgan Robertson and Jack Thayer in today's episode. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow to hear how a quiet Sunday ended with the Titanic's fatal collision with an iceberg. Until then, enjoy your day, and thank you so much for joining me for another serving of Single Alt History.